Hi. So yeah, we're going to talk about what the generic Linux world can learn from the embedded Linux world today. Okay, this works. So oh yeah, uh, I'm Michael. This is Bo. Hi. Um, yeah. So we both kind of come from the embedded world, and. From what we learned there, we thought, hey, maybe this can also help other people who use Linux in a non-embedded uh, context. So yeah, in embedded, one of the main problems, let's say, is the end user usually doesn't even know that we exist, right? So it's just running somewhere under the hood, whatever. So we have to deal with stuff like instant power offs. So we can't rely on a graceful shutdown because if the user pulls the plug or turns off their car or whatever, we're just dead, and then we have to recover from that on next boot. Um, we have reliable updates, because if the user doesn't know we exist, they also just see, oh, my car doesn't turn on anymore. Yeah, now I'm complaining. I have no way of fixing this. Um, we also want to use our hardware to the maximum extent. I mean, everybody does that, but especially in Embedded, where you are selling lots of small chips, you want to kind of cheap out on these chips, so you want to use them as good as you can. Uh, and yeah, to facilitate all this, we also want to be as minimal as possible, obviously, because, well, the less area for errors, the less errors, hopefully. And then in generic Linux, I mean, probably everybody here has used the generic Linux before, but basically we want to be as versatile as it gets, we want to allow everything, we want uh, to expect uh, surprises from the user, so the user changes the system, we don't just want to collapse in on ourselves. And yeah, the user also wants to expand the system. So add periphery, add new software, whatever. So how do we kind of combine the two now? <laughs> um, so the standard workflow in uh, uh, generic Linux is basically you provision it, you deploy it, you configure it, you use it. And the, this one usually is just running the installer, right? And then you want to configure it how you think you want it, you want to use it, Notice, oh wait, no, that's not how I want it. So you configure again, use it again, configure again, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's how you usually use it. Uh, so yeah, this has uh, some good parts, some bad parts, and some uh, parts. <laughs> uh, so the good part is this is well tested. There's products and solutions for everything that people know people can use. So that's not a problem. Also, we don't have the constraints of small chips and whatnot. It's cheap, you can use AWS, you can have a giant hard drive, whatever. We don't care. Also, hey, it's great for job security. If there's lots of stuff to fix, then people can fix it, yay. Um, the bad parts, uh, we need a lot of additional software to do that. We have to have stuff installed out of the box that the user will need to expand it because we have to expect everything. So we can also not really optimize for what the user is going to do, because if we don't know what the user is going to do, well, how are we going to optimize for it, right? We just have to deliver everything, expect everything. And with all of that, like I always said before, uh, errors is equal to more code squared. So the more stuff we deploy, the more stuff is on the disk, the more stuff can go wrong. And now to the very problematic stuff. Uh, so with uh, in-place updates, they can break everything basically, right? So you have mechanisms already in place just to recover from your broken update. Um, you have to do all your configuration usually after you already uh, created your uh, image. And it's overall very fragile. So, and because of all of that, people are kind of afraid to update them sometimes. So worst case, you get out of date systems with security issues and whatnot. So uh, in place updates, like I said, they can break and they can break horribly if you have a uh, incompatibility. You get configuration drift because, oh, I updated this, so now I have to fix that, and then I update another thing, and now this is not as it was in the original image, and so on. Also, horrible problems. Um, you don't really have the time to test your changes when you're updating them on the live system, right? And yeah, this causes a lot of very complicated bugs, and especially these two are very in love because as soon as you divert from what other people think you have on your system, it's going to get horrible to debug. Um, yeah, generic fragility. Uh, there's an old adage. It's uh, 
never change a running system. And you think, no, no, I, I know what I'm doing. And I, I said, never change a running system. No, no, I'm a special snowflake. I'm just going to touch this one config. No, don't change a running system. You're going to break it. And yeah, post install configuration also. This means you need to install the utilities for the configuration. So you need Ansible, you need salt, you need something, right? Again, this is not optimized for your specific setup because you want to configure something you don't know. And this means tools and tools and tools and runtimes and more tools. And results in enormous bloatware. So, you know, you have like 50 packages on your system and you're not even doing what you're trying to do. That's just the setup to get the system to start doing anything. Right? So, in actuality, the cycle kind of looks like this. You configure it, you cry because it doesn't work, you try to configure it, you cry again. <laughs> so, but is there a better world possible, Bo? Uh, I don't know yet. You can give me that thing. Oh, yeah, but you need to click it. I was one of those journals that I was developing the um, configuration management system. And uh, lately I was talking to Cloudflare and explaining them how to build a better si system uh, instead of salt because it's kind of like phasing out lately. So what is a better workflow? We know that there is kind of like that. So you configure first, you provision, deploy, use, right? So that was kind of like before we know the immutable systems, right? But they didn't really stick together. The question is why exactly? And especially I was talking to Neil Gompa and he said, well, that's solid, this works, except it does not work on heter heterogeneous uh, in, in infrastructure, right? Because if you have a different uh, servers, right? So one of those works on Azure, some of those works on the Google Cloud somewhere, on AWS or your own hardware somewhere, you need those small changes, those small little differences, right? And we kind of like f fixed that with Kiwi images. We created Project Bare Mill, so to say. It's like uh, basically it wraps the Kiwi system, uh, it uses it as a library, and we have those derivatives. So basically, you have one appliance Kiwi, and you have like those small little changes that you can extra make. But that doesn't really solve all the problems, apparently. And so, yeah, I, I agree on that. So what do we do more? Next generation configuration management is all I would like to talk about. And when we say next generation, does not mean it's much, much, much better or something like that. It's just newer wave of uh, paradigm of thinking of that. How do you apply what you have today? Where we go next? Right, and then you can have next generation, and next generation, next generation, right? So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that you have to remove the bloatware and made straight to the point, right? So, you don't want really to have um, all on your server. I don't think, maybe you want, but I don't, sorry. Um, keep, only the, keep only maximum used components. So, that's what we do in embedded. If you have a little device like this one, Every bit of this is really used. And we say, if you have, if, if you know your system, right, why would you need bin LS? You know your system, so what's the problem there, right? And then don't touch a running system. I don't want to touch running system. I was working in Tokyo Bank for years. And uh, when five minutes outage in Data Mart system, you will lost the millions there, and so you, it might cost your career. So, no, don't. And keep full flexibility of genetic systems. That's what I want. So, especially those two together, they don't love each other. One says, remove everything, and other says, make it as flexible as possible. How do you exactly achieve that part, right? So that's the question is. Um, that's the logo of micro OS. Um, Transactional update does not prevent update failures on the system. It only reliably delivers them. So, yeah, you can reliably update it. You can get back to that. That's not really new. We have this mechanism in Solaris system like 25 years ago around. You can have a ZFS, you can make a snapshot, you can boot back if you have a broken system. That, that's fine, but you still have a broken system that you have to go back, right? 
So uh, how about that? You configure, you build and test it. And then after you build and test it, you publish and use it. So you repeat here, and that is kind of like read-only part. So let's look at that a little bit more. Configuration for specific infrastructure nodes. So here, when you configure it, you have your derivatives, you have your database, you have your sold state that says, well, that node will be generated for Azure, that node will be generated for my laptop, or, 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 and, and so on, so on, so on, right? Um, second, you build an image and test it. So uh, in the production, usually in industri big in in industrial, uh, big industrials, we have usually typical development, test, and uh, production environments, and we always say that test and pr production environment has to be identical, and it's never true. So how do we do that that it's actually true? So deploy and update also as an OCI container, and that is interesting part I would like to talk about. So how about you would do that? Configure, build, test, and put it back to the registry. And for that, you can have a lot of various tools. That's uh, Kiwi, supposed to be logo. I didn't find a better one. So uh, you can use all the packages, whatever you want packages. It doesn't make it have to be RPM. It can be Debian, it can be Slackware, whatever. Ansible, Salt, Open Build Service, Open QA, whatever, right? So uh, all those tools you have and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's your line here, right? So you stay there. Here is where your test environment is. And then you deploy, and then you use and pull updates that. Basically what I'm talking about, bootable containers. What I'm talking about, you have a, con uh, you treat your system as a container. So that's what you can take from em embedded practices. Why we never think in packages? because we're afraid of configuration drift. We're afraid the system can be a little bit changed and we update that package and you break the device. That's what we're afraid the most. So we give you an image which is really tested, really working, you flash that. Because, you know, where I work, I have a hardware where you flash and, and burn the fuses so you cannot flash it again. And if hardware costs a couple of, thou of, of thousands of, of euros, you flash it wrong, well, you, you lost it, just that. And uh, that's what we're talking about, right? And that uh, plays very perfectly. To, so you have a configuration with every tools you want, but at the end you render your system only what you need to use. And that's kind of like, basically configuration makes a home office, so to say, re re remotely work on your system, right? And you're done touching the running system. So one of the, uh, you can scan that if you want. So uh, basically, the one project, what I learned at Red Hat conference two weeks ago, or, or three, yeah. Uh, it's a boot, uh, bootsy, a bootable container, the transactional in place operating system updates using OCI container images. Um, yeah, uh, second, what we did already together, that's, uh, basically uh, the question, why would you need system D on your server? Like really, when you think of it. If you want to have some typical workload, right? What would, why would you need system D with all this stuff? Why do you even need UDEV there, if you really think so? But MDEV is enough. I'm not talking that this is a replacement for system D, no way. Because if you need a desktop, of course you need media, camera, keyboard, and everything, 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 right? But what if you have a very specific target and then you generate that image for that specific target that probably you need only task to be started and this is it. For example, I don't need network manager on my server. I ported just NetIFD uh, from OpenVRT, which is like 300 kilobytes and does the same thing. Why I wouldn't need that network manager that takes me hundreds of other packages? I don't need that, seriously. You need, don't need that too. And so Microhop, that one, one my, my of the projects uh, that uh, I, when I booted uh, SUSE Linux, uh, they call it MicroS, I guess, and that MicroS, uh, so MicroS like one gigabyte of image, and I was like, uh, if, if, if I start the run, uh, RAMFS, why it starts systemd in, in RAMFS? It's, you know, uh, so, 
And I was like thinking about that, how can I replace that? Because in automotive, again, we need to start Linux within two seconds, just that. We, we're not allowed to wait until forever it runs all that stuff, right? And so I wrote um, in iterd in Rust. It's basically a very, very small thing. That's screenshot of it. Basically, it's just one binary there, statically linked. It's one uh, configuration which says which uh, root uh, kernel modules you want to have. And it has kernel modules, and that's it. And it starts. It completely standalone, doesn't need any libc, nothing. It's just, just that. Um, yeah, it is that small, 205 megabytes. Yeah. Um, so that's the, uh, t your target, how it would look like. You have an ITRMFS, it doesn't have to be microhop, you can use your systemd if you want, but I don't recommend that. So you have a kernel, you have kernel modules. Then on top of that, you have uh, some minimal init system, can be systemd, of course, if you want, your, your choice. Your, you have a libc, you have busybox, net ifd, and that question mark, what is this, right? So. It can be boot C, of course. Uh, then let me talk. Uh, so you have then your containers runtime can be whatever uh, runtime you want, and then you on top of that you can have your workflow, right? So that's basically how you render your image on your on your server, and 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 instead of updating all that stuff. Uh, you either pulling new images, or if you want to put that machine in elsewhere, you just kill it and you just regenerate it again uh, elsewhere. So, right. Um, one thing, uh, when I started to look at Bootsy, I found that they asking OS3. I don't want to have OS3 everywhere. They asking systemd only. I don't want to have systemd only. They're asking to have RPMs only. And that's not the case for me. I'm also using Debian. And so I wanted to have something that fits everywhere. So is it uh, OpenSUSE, it's Fedora, it's Debian, it's Slackware, Arch, whatever. I want that. So uh, I wanted to, to show you a demo today, but you know, the Boot C guys took uh, one and a half year to develop it. I had only one and a half weeks. So. I, I, I uh, get to the installation part that it boots, but it's really shaky, and I don't want to show you that because it might crash, so it's not very well. So I still need a couple of days to make it working. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's currently as a pr proof of concept. So uh, problems I'm trying to solve here, that you work on the updates, uh, and it fully isolated away from your, yeah, I'm faster than 10 minutes. So uh, work on the updates fully isolated, and no more post-install con configuration. So you install and configure it first, and then you just let it work. So because it is identical what is on your um, infrastructure here, test environment, it will be the same on a production. It's like one-to-one. -one. And uh, remove generic bloatware and fle flexibility is kept, so you put on the target only what you really use and nothing else, right? Because all the configurations you have on your table. Um, that's also secure. Uh, reliable system, no fear to keep it updated. Why we fear updated system? I remember we had uh, so, not even that you don't afraid to uh, update the system, but you know that if you upgrade the system, it might break. And so you are refrain to update it and only do this because you really, really need to do that. And you are like trembling your hands, you know, so in, in bank especially, if that server will go down, what will happen and so on, right? But now you don't have this fear because you updated it. You just can uh, like, ask the machine to, to get to that te tested state that you already have. And yeah, it boots very fast. So uh, also, I want to say that people all around the world, they heard about that OpenSUSE wants to drop the logo, you know. So they are protesting, you know, and they don't like that idea. So keep the identity. That's it. If you have a que questions, go ahead. But other otherwise, this.
Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, you said you can boot the image in two seconds. Uh, first of all, this depends very much on the hardware, I yes. guess. <laughs> and then also on your kernel, because your kernel is very, very big. Uh, right, uh, that depends, of course, but uh, your kernel is very big. For example, you need, uh, I would suggest to have like three kernels. One is very generic, one is uh, minimum-ish, generic-ish, and one is very stripped, you know, so for example, right, so you can have it. With, with OBS, you can make it multi-built. Yeah, so, and the, the follow-up is, um, I also work in Embedded, and I know in the automotive industry, by law, every system needs to run at after 500 milliseconds. Do you think that is also achievable with... 500 milliseconds Linux, do we have that? Uh, uh, we stripped that really, really badly, so uh, we could achieve 600-ish, but that's the, the very very tough. We really stripped it completely, and the problem is also that the mainline kernel from SUSE it requires like a lot of RAM. So my hardware has only 64k M, M so, sorry, right? So um, that's a lot. The, yeah, exactly. So we need to strip it. We need to really down, and that's that's why I would suggest if you have this, for you if you use those practices for the server side, right? So you have kernel which is like uh, stripped from all the genetic stuff like you didn't, don't need braille display on the server right so you don't need that part so you can kick it out yeah. and, and what's the limiting factor is it then the cpu cycles or is it more kind of the the driver uh, the drive the, the the flash memory whatever you're using mm, that's also uh, we usually have problems also with io and then it also depends on the file system you use we, for example, had in embedded for a long time X4 until I, I never liked that system, file system ever. So I started to research and I have solid numbers that XFS is just beating it up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, not really a question, but you heard about Talos, or Talos Linux. It's a distribution that it's basically very minimal and it only runs containers. There's Kubernetes on top of it. So it, it's basically the picture that you showed, but it's a distribution that exists that is somewhat popular. So I'm not sure so, if you heard. So what the question is? That's not the question. No, just the question if you heard about Talos. That, Talos that's funny that, because. That is, it, it provides like the stack that you showed. It is basically a very minimal. Kernel, right. very minimal packages installed, just the essential to get the system to boot, and then a container engine, the, the and good, then you deploy on top of it. The good thing about, I actually never heard about that, thanks about that, but I, I look. But the good thing about science is that we always, when we repeat our problems and tests, we always come to the same conclusions, you know. So uh, I, I never heard about that, actually, but that, that the someone is doing exactly the same way. It only proves that it's, we are on the right path, right? Yeah, they, they so. wrote their own in its system, their own network manager-like and other things. Because they wrote the, it in Go. The, Question I was also asked on in Cloudflare, guys. Uh, I, I said, how exactly you are going to update with Ansible things that are basically IoT, like they're, they're very small devices. You, you can't, you know. So, yeah. But you still need configuration management on that, right? And 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 the uh, the whole world is moving to containers, and the whole paradigm of Ansible or Salt is getting obsolete-ish. It still will be around, I, I believe, for a long time, but it goes to be already segregated in the containers, and uh, you probably want different means to, to deploy that. Uh, another question, um, I'm not sure if, if you have a solution for it, but when you're working with embedded, you always build a very customized kernel. You remove everything you don't need. Not exactly. Um, usually, usually okay. you, you, you don't need to, but you usually remove things that you, you don't want, like file systems and yeah, other it, things. It, it depends, so, but yes, yeah. So let's take think about like open source or uh, is Lee. Different kind of versions means you need to maintain and test all these things. So is there a solution that you could 
Without yes, I, like uh, uh, I, I build everything. Everything has modules, and oh, this system needs this, this, and that, and you bring that up. I understand the, the question. We have partially solved that till seventy percent, kind of like the wonderful stuff Suze has is OBS. Trust me, it is the best stuff on the market. I can say. So we tried different Koji and others. And we think OBS is just shine, shines everywhere, and it's one thing what it, it has multi build. So you can have the same kernel, same source, but different configurations. That's, that's not even canonical doing. That's yes. fantastic. Yes, but you still have different, different packages. Because yeah. you're using mood build, so it's a different kind of config. My, my, my idea is if you could build as much as possible as modules, so the modules are in different packages, and you install the main kernel, just bare minimum. Oh, by the way, you have this Wi-Fi driver, this yeah, other thing. You just load the package. Or that's what the, the microhop is doing ah. the, in ETRD. I only when I say uh, what I need from the modules, it loads that. So, okay. and that's I have I have another pro, uh, project called um, what. Uh, limo pack, yeah, exactly. So I take all those 7,000 modules and throw them away and I leave on the machine only what I need. Last question. Okay, thank you. Last question, anyone? No, it was last question. So, <laughs> thanks.